This program is made possible by the members of the Church Street Baptist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. Thank you all so much for being with us. It is my honor to come into your home this week. And in just a moment, I want to take you into a service that we had here at the church last Sunday night. And we're going to talk a little bit about prophecy today. So I want you to get your Bible and go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 47. And I want to talk to you today about the prophecy of the Dead Sea. I take a trip to the Holy Land every year and I'm always amazed with how the Holy Land and what my mentor said is the fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John tell us of the life of the Lord Jesus. But God used that Holy Land of Israel, that land that was promised to Jacob, that land that was promised to that nation of descendants from Abraham. To those people, God uses the land to tell the story of the salvation of mankind. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that today as we look at the Dead Sea. Every time I go to the Dead Sea, I'm amazed at how it's drying up and the sea line, the shoreline is receding. And I've often wondered why. And I studied in the book of Ezekiel a few months ago on this prophecy concerning the Dead Sea, how that one day a river will flow out from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and will flow all the way down to the Dead Sea. And the Bible says there'll be so many fish in the Dead Sea that they'll hang their nets at En Gedi. I want to take you there in just a moment, but before that we do, I want to invite you and your family today, you still have time to get here, for a special Thanksgiving service. By the Lord's will today, I'm going to preach a message to the people that are gathered together, and I want you to be a part of it. We have one service this morning. There's not 9.30, just one service today at 10.30. Afterwards, we're going to go down into our fellowship building and have a family-style Thanksgiving meal. And we want you to be a part of that. It's absolutely free of charge. We just want to meet you, and we want to get to know you. You still have time if you're in the Charlotte area or up into the foothills of North Carolina, or if you're here in the Piedmont, you have time to get here today at 1030. Come and join us. No service tonight. We look forward to seeing you today. May God bless you. Let's go now into the message, The Prophecy. Dead Sea. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. This in chapter 47, 1 through 12, is the prophecy of the Dead Sea. And tonight, that's what I want to talk to you about, this prophecy here of the Dead Sea. When I've been to Israel the last couple of times that I've been, I've noticed something as I go down to the Dead Sea. I have a picture of this, that the Dead Sea is receding. Every year, the waters roll back more and more and more. Within the last 100 years, the Dead Sea has gone from the place it was and has been there for thousands of years. It has gone back almost 400 yards. Get that in your mind. That's four football fields in 100 years. Riding along the highway, there is a marker that where the water stood in 1948 when the nation of Israel was formed and founded. And today when you go down, the waters are almost 135 yards beyond that. It's unbelievable. You can see in that picture, it almost looks like, looks like the tide is coming out, right? But that's the way it is all the time. The waters of the Dead Sea never move. There is no ripple. There is no current. There is no wave. It's just dead. 
It is dead. It is dead. It is dead. Now, here is what you need to understand. Go back to verse 1 and let me define some words here in this passage, all right? Verse number 1, just so we know what we're talking about. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. What house is that? That's the temple that is rebuilt in Jerusalem. Now, when is it rebuilt? It's rebuilt during the tribulation. That is the Antichrist that rebuilds the temple. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but I, I've got all types of paperwork. I've got all types of pictures that I could show you. And we've seen it. They have actually already cut the cornerstone of the temple. They have already cut the cornerstone of the temple. And what they are waiting on, right? The only thing they're waiting on is Jerusalem, the Israeli guards, to go and retake the entire temple mount away from the Jordanian Waff police. If you remember 1967, 1967, there was the Six-Day War. And a man by the name of Moshe Dayan, who was the chief of staff of the Israeli army at that time, he retook, they retook the entire city of Jerusalem. They unified the city of Jerusalem. But the lady who was in charge, or the man that was in charge at that time, his name, if I believe, if I'm correct, was Levi Eshkol. Levi Eshkol was the prime minister of the nation of Israel. And Moshe Dayan, the, the, the chief of staff of the Israeli army, at the time when they retook it, that day, when they retook the Temple Mount at the Six Day War, the Jewish, uh, the Israeli army went up on top of the Jewish Temple Mount for the first time in 1900 years. And they cried and they sang the songs of Zion as they, for, for the first time in 1900 years. But Moshe Dayan was not a religious Jew. And this is what he did. He took Jerusalem and he split it. And he said, we're going to give back part of Jerusalem to what at that time was known as the Arab. And he did that for this reason. He and Levi Eshkol realized something. They realized if we don't give back part of the Temple Mount, what is a regional conflict will be a worldwide conflict. And at that time, the political ramifications, they knew that the Soviet Union would fight, fight with the Arabs, but they were not convinced at that time that Lyndon Johnson, who had just committed our troops to, uh, to Vietnam, would back us, back Jerusalem militarily. So he gives back Jerusalem, gives back part of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. So 34 acres, roughly, of land known as the Temple Mount today is under Jordanian control. All right? Now, that is why it's so important. Every time on the news you see the temple mentioned, you see Jerusalem mentioned, you need to pay attention because one of these days there's going to be a hardliner in the Knesset and the hardliner who is in the prime minister's seat is going to get sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired of all the political jargon and he's going to send Israeli troops on top of that temple mount and they're going to take that temple mount back. And you watch out, brothers and sisters, because it's going to be all-out war when that happens. And here's what's going to happen. I believe it. Here's what's going to happen. It's going to be a war of wars between the Jew and the Arab. And a man is going to stand up. And he's going to say, I can broker a peace deal between these two people. And we will have peace for seven years. And the man that brokers that peace deal is what the Bible calls the son of of perdition, the Antichrist. That's why this is all so important. So anyway, so there's seven years later, verse 1. So the door of the house is the rebuilt temple, which is rebuilt by the Antichrist. Keep going. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. What is that? Well, here's what's happening. In Zechariah chapter 14, you don't have to turn there, but write, write it down. In Zechariah 14, the Bible tells us what happens when Jesus comes at the second coming. At the end of the tribulation, the Bible says they are gathered together in the fields of Megiddo. Holly, Reggie will be there. I'll show you where they'll gather together. 200 million troops. And Jesus comes in the air. And he smites them with the word of his mouth. And a sword issues forth 
and slays 200 million people. The Bible says the blood, there's so much blood, it comes up to the horse's bridle and runs the entire length of that valley. But Jesus doesn't set foot down, though. I've got a picture, uh, Kim, I want you to show me, of the Mount of Olives. All right? The Mount of Olives. We are standing on the Temple Mount in this picture looking at the Mount of Olives. Do you see that little golden dome right in the middle? That's called the Church of the Ascension. Do you see that little building down to the left at the bottom of the screen? That's the church at Gethsemane. Those, those trees that are spotted, those are olive trees. Those trees right there, that is where Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. But where we are looking at the ascension, that golden dome, that's the church of the ascension, that is where they believe Jesus ascended up into heaven. And what did the angel say in Acts chapter number 1? As you have seen him go, so he will return in like manner. And Jesus is going to come down according to Zechariah chapter number 14. And here is what happens. Jesus comes and he descends. And the moment that his two feet hit the Mount of Olives, the scripture says that that mountain cleaves in half. And that mountain splits. You know, scientists, geologists have found that there's a tectonic plate that runs, a small fracture line that runs right in the middle of that mountain. And you know where it runs? It runs straight through those olive trees. And do you know where we're standing? If you're looking, we're looking right there in Jerusalem. Imagine you're there. Do you know where we're standing? We're standing at the eastern gate. So imagine that fault line runs straight down the middle. It's going to hit where my feet are. And my feet are at the eastern gate. So what does it say in verse 1? The waters issued out, see it, from the threshold of the house eastward. That river is going to split right along that tectonic plate. And a river is going to come out. Do you know there's a fountain under there right now? There's a spring. You've heard about it. It's called the Gihon Spring. It's where Hezekiah tunneled. But anyways, I'm, I'm getting... I, I talk, I've talked about this all night. I can't talk about this all night, but I talk about it all night. So here's what happens. That river splits... But watch this. Gushing water has to go somewhere, doesn't it? Where does it go? It goes what? Down. You see where those trees are right there in that picture at the bottom of the picture? That's a valley called the Kidron Valley. And the Kidron Valley runs all the way out of Jerusalem. And Ju they didn't know what they were doing. They were just figured it'd be a good place. Kim, I've got a road map. Now, don't put it up yet. I've got a road map. So the waters, it says, keep going from verse 47. And we get to verse 46. Or excuse me, verse number 6. So verse 1 through 5, it talks about how deep the water gets as we go down. Now watch this. In order for water to get from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, it can't cut through a mountain. Water's not going to go through a mountain. Am I right about it? It's got to have a path. A few years ago, Israel cut a road that runs from Jerusalem all the way to the banks of the Dead Sea. It's called Highway 1. I'm going to show you a picture of Highway 1 in Israel. See the red part of that map down on the bottom right-hand side? Highway 1 runs all the way from Tel Aviv straight to the Dead Sea. But there in Jerusalem, from where it goes from blue to red, can you see that? That road in red cuts all the way. Do you see the Dead Sea at the bottom right-hand side of your screen, the little blue you see the little blue? That river's going to flow. Do you know why it takes those... you know why the, the Israeli uh, authority cut that road kind of like that? Because that's the way the elevation goes. And that river's going to flow all the way down to the Dead Sea. And watch what happens. As soon as that water cuts into the Dead Sea... As soon as it hits the Dead Sea, do you know what's going to happen? Life. But there's a problem. There's a problem. Do you know why the Dead Sea is dead? The Dead Sea is dead for two reasons. Number one, this will explain a lot to some of you. Number one, the reason the Dead Sea is dead is because it brims with, it brims with salt. The salt. The salt in there, if you get in, it's actually like swimming in baby oil. It's how thick it is. It's a film. It's, it, I, I just, it just it doesn't bless me. It blesses a lot of people, but it doesn't bless me. If I wanted to swim in baby oil, I'd fill my bathtub up 
I mean, it's just, it's the craziest feeling on your skin. Do you know why it's like that? It's because of sulfur pits that are beneath it. Where did they come from? Genesis chapter number 15, 16 and 17 tell us about this place around the Dead Sea. It was called the Plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot sees the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah that they are well watered. So this used to be a lush place. Can you imagine? If the Dead Sea was a brimming pond or lake, they'd be fish. That's why Lot looked at it and said, this is beautiful. I want this. I want to be a part of this. But what did God do? He rained down fire and... You know what brimstone is? It's sulfur. It's sulfur. That's why the Dead Sea is dead, because of the judgment of God. The second reason the Dead Sea is dead is because the Dead Sea has an inflow, but no outflow. Everything that comes into the Dead Sea, it just sits there. It just sits there. You could put it like this. It takes more than it gives. It never redistributes what it has. It just dies when it gets in there. Now, now let's, let's, let's look at this a little bit. So what happens? The water comes out. It splits. Now, what do you know about the Dead Sea? I'm going somewhere. Just hold on. What do you know about the Dead Sea? The Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. Why is it the lowest place on earth? Well, number one, because when God rained down fire and brimstone, what happens when a meteor hits the earth craters you know what happened God sent fire and stones out of heaven and pulverized that land beat the devil just drove it down and I don't know if he drove it down 1700 feet it's about 1700 feet below sea level I have no idea I just know that when we go to the Dead Sea you know what it looks like it looks like somebody took a big rock and just just squashed it Watched it. Now, in order for the Dead Sea to live, in order for the Dead Sea to live, water can't just go into it. It's got to what? Flow out. Now watch this. Remember what we said? Water, water doesn't flow up. If it's 1,700 feet below sea level, you've got to make that water rise 1,700 feet. Am I right? I mean, if my theory, if, if this book is right. Now watch this. How much water does it take to fill up a hole 1,700 feet deep? A lot of water. How much water does it take to fill up a hole that deep? Well, it takes a lot. But even a little bit will do it. It'll just take a lot of time. Right? Maybe like a thousand years. You think maybe a thousand years would do it? Now I don't know. All I know is it says sometime in the millennium. It doesn't talk about when it it just says it happens. But there's enough water. Now here's my point, and then I'm going to preach, and then I'm going to be done. Here's the point. There's enough water flowing out from where the king just went to cure everything that's dead. Nothing can stay dead when the water touches it. It doesn't matter if it's been dead, just got dead, or thinking about dying. When the water touches it, that just split from where the king was, I'm telling you, it hits it. Now, here is the question. What is God trying to prove with this scripture? Remember this. Everything in this book is not trying to tell us about what we read. It's trying to tell us about what Jesus did for us on the cross. Remember what I've told you? Everything in the Old Testament points to the cross, and everything in the New Testament points back. 
to the cross. So here is the question. What is that a type of? What is that a picture of? Well, number one, let's think about it. Who is this Son of Man that comes out of the heavens? I'll tell you who it is. It's Jesus Christ. It's the Lord of glory. And only He is the one that can split the mountain. Only He can bring water out of a rock. Only He can bring water where there is no water. Only He can move mountains. Only He, Lord God, the more I talk about this, the better off it's getting. Only He can move mountains. Only He can split rock. Only He can do what He can do. I can't split rock. You can't split rock. But God can split rock. Number two, what is that river a type of? What is river a type of in your Bible? It's a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. Water is a twofold picture in your Bible. Number one, when you see still water, when you see water in a basin, that's a type of the Word of God. It is that which I cleanse myself in. It is that which is always there. It never moves. It's constant. It never changes. And this book is forever settled in heaven. It is constant. It never changes. But what I dip in dirty comes out clean. It's a picture of the Word of God. But moving water in the Bible is a type of the Holy Spirit of God. That river that flows. Now, why Watch this. What do I know about that river that flows? Number one, I find that it comes out from the eastern gate. Do you know what's under that? It's the throne of God, the holy of holies. You know where that river comes from? It comes from the presence of God. Do you know what the picture is there? It's the Holy Spirit. Who sent the Holy Spirit from the Father? It was Jesus that bid him come. Who sent the holy mighty Spirit of God? It was Jesus that was crucified. And the river flows. Now watch this. How deep does the spirit get well when I first get into it it just comes to my ankles and I say boy this is pretty good I like splashing around in this I like getting around in this I feel clean I feel refreshed I feel excited but I get going further and I get deeper and I go further with the spirit and then it gets up to my kneecaps and I say my heavens I, I don't know I guess I can still handle this I guess I can still take this I, st- I guess that I can still deal with this but then I keep on going a little bit further and it gets up to my waist. You know what I start saying? Wait a second. I don't know if this is what I signed up for. I don't know if this is what I want to deal with. I don't know if this is all I thought it would be. And then I go further and it gets up and I say, I can't take it. It's bigger than me. It's higher than me. You know what you do? You just get out and let the river be the river. You get out of it and stop trying to control it. You just say, let the river be the river. Let it flow where it's going to flow. Watch this. He doesn't try to swim in it. He just follows it. Stop trying to control the Holy Spirit. Just walk where He takes you. And He follows. But you know what He finds out about that river? He finds everywhere it flows, light comes. Walking into the desert, rivers there, trees there. Walking into the desert, rivers there, flowers there. Walking into the desert, and watch this. You ready? The lower He goes, the deeper the water gets. Brothers and sisters, hear me. That's a twofold picture. Number one, the more humble we get before God, the more God will reveal Himself to us. When we get to our lowest point and we say, My God, I'm a nothing, He says, Let me show you more about me. Number two, where is 1,700 feet? Where's the Dead Sea? If I can put it like this, that's as close to hell as you can get on earth. You with me? The closer you get to the pits of hell, the more of the Holy Spirit it takes. Don't think you can charge the gates of hell by yourself. You need to be filled, baptized, infused, in flux, whatever you want to say, with the power of the Spirit of the living God. You want to fight the devil? You want to fight this? You want to fight that? Hallelujah, go for it. But you better be filled up with something from another world. Now here's the other picture. You know what that Dead Sea is a type of? It's a five-fold type, number one. It's a type of Israel. Israel is dead today. They have no spiritual life. They have no spiritual gumption. They're just bones that have been brought back together in 1948. But what happens when the Holy Spirit hits them in the book of Ezekiel? The Bible says, and into those bones and sinews, God breathes. One day, 
One day the Holy Ghost is going to baptize Israel in the tribulation in the power and salvation of the Lord Jesus and that which was dead will be brought back to life and that which they used to mock and that which they used to laugh at and that which the world is used to ridicule. You know what they'll do? They'll be fishing by the waters and going and hanging their nets at Ang Gedi and one day Israel, which, we, which people say is dead and useless, will be brimming with life and spiritual hope. Number two, it's a type of a sinner. You know what you and I were before the Holy Spirit convicted us of our sin? We were dead in trespasses and sin. Everything that touched us died. Everything that touches the Dead Sea died. You stay in the Dead Sea long enough, Jerry Chestnut, it was the funniest thing I have ever seen. Me and him laugh about this all the time. There was one thing they say about the Dead Sea. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not let it get in your eyes. Do not let it get in your eyes. If it gets in your eyes, it, will, it can blind you. People have done some crazy things thinking they can see. It will blind you. Ladies and gentlemen, I touched one time. I took the tip of my finger and put it on my tongue. It is the most bitter thing you have ever, ever wanted. If you drink it, it, can make, it will make you deathly, deathly sick. It was the funniest thing I have ever seen in my life. If Jerry was here, I'd let him, I'd let him laugh with us because I've laughed at it. All of a sudden, Jerry got out there. The problem with the Dead Sea is walking on, it's like walking on glass. You've got to have shoes on. Mr. Mr. Michael was there. We, we still laugh about this. It's, so you've got to have like sandals on. Otherwise, it, it'll, it'll rip your feet to shred. You know the problem with open wounds and salt water? Mm-hmm. So here's the problem at the Dead Sea. You can't sink. You cannot sink. You cannot drown in the Dead Sea. It, you, you, you cannot. You just, if you go under, you bob right back up. So they tell you. They say this. They say you just barely, Jacob was there, you just barely sit down and you'll float. Jared thought he'd be funny. Jared thought he'd do a little cannonball action out there in the Dead Sea. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't, when they say fire hot, I don't have to test that sign. That's not me. Fence electric, I don't have to test it. Never been me. You tell me the border's there, I don't push borders. So you know what I did? Me and Jacob were out there, and I just, I just kind of sat down in it, and I floated, and I got my feel, and I got out. Well, as I'm walking out, I forgot my shoes, and as I'm walking out over the salt, I think, man, this is hurting, this is killing me. I look up and there's old Jerry Chestnut. He's gone. He's done gotten out in the water. He's done walked out to the middle of the water. And it was gotten deep enough where he could do something about it. And this is what I saw Jerry do. He jumped up out of the water and yelled, Cannonball! But as soon as he hit that water, he just, I mean, he went under. But the buoyancy of the water just, whoop, and it just flipped him. And you just saw Jerry just roll in the water. Here's the problem with Jerry. He didn't realize it was going to do it. And he went under like this. He comes up screaming like a three-year-old girl. Ah! And here's what's so funny about it. He can't see a thing. And this is what he's doing. Help! Help! And I'm telling you right now, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Somebody went, Marco! <laughs> the point... Everything that touches that water will die or be poisoned. When you were dead in trespasses and sins, everything that came into your life died. That's the reason some of you can't figure out how to stay married. Some of you can't figure out how to keep a job. Some of you can't figure out how to do this church thing. You're dead in trespasses and sins and everything you touch dies. It's a type of a sinner. But what happens when the river of the Holy Spirit washes into that water? Man, it cuts out every bit of that deadness. It cuts out every bit of that salt. It washes.